Good morning. Welcome to the Power Professional Section 2011 Spring Meeting. Collaborations across the <laughs> Collaborations across libraries. I'm Marguerite Miller, the Power Section Chair. We are pleased to be co-sponsoring with our colleagues the special and institutional section. Thank you all for attending this meeting. We are glad that you are here and I encourage any of you who are not members of the powers to consider becoming one. The obligation is minimal and the benefits are great. We have 52 attendees all scattered across Nebraska from such places as Beatrice, Bellevue, DeWitt, Fairbury, Maywood, Papillion, Sydney, Norfolk, Lincoln, and Omaha. It is truly amazing that so many people from around the state share a common passion for library work. I would also like to thank Martha Grinsbach for all her time, effort, and expertise in setting up this spring meeting. This is his, her fourth year, and each year it's getting better. However, Martha is retiring as chair, but this is a wonderful opportunity for someone to step up and become chair for next year's spring meeting. If you are watching with multiple people on the same computer, would you please type in everyone's name in the chat box so that they can get their continuing education credits. Carolyn Dow from the special and institutional section is ready to give some welcoming comments. On behalf of NLA's special and institutional section, welcome to the spring meeting. You may have already guessed, but the special and institutional section doesn't have a monopoly on special. All libraries are special, as are the people who work in them, you who are here today. You could say we are exceptional because there are exceptions to every generalization about special libraries. The term special libraries usually conjures up libraries of law and medicine. But we're much more than that. We are unique libraries and collections developed to further the goals of the agencies, institutions, organizations, and corporations that we serve and who fund us. That means we are purpose-driven. Our users are often defined by the organization and may be limited to employees, researchers, organizational members, or residents of our institutions. And while we hold dear basic core values of libraries, in our daily practice of special librarianship, we may have to, for example, limit access of materials to those deemed appropriate to the treatment plan of a psychiatric patient by his physician or therapist, decline to interpret medical or legal information, or select books only from the denomination's official publisher for our church library. On the other hand, special libraries may participate in interlibrary loan, may be open to anyone with an interest in the topics collected, and frequently must collaborate and cooperate to serve the needs of our defined users. I hope you learned something today and that you get lots of ideas to think about and to share with your colleagues. And if you get a chance, either later today or in the future, please come visit me at the Poly Music Library, part of Lincoln City Libraries, just a block over from the Library Commission. Welcome. Thank you, Carolyn. We have three great sessions ahead of us, a short break in between. I hope you will enjoy it and learn something that you can take home and take to your job and so that you can use on your job. Our first speaker is Deborah Dracos of the Nebraska Library Commission talking about Let's Work Together. Thank you, Marguerite. Good morning, everyone. Um, I want to do just one little technology thing first. If you have problems hearing, um, please let us know. 
If you have a question, please be sure to raise your hand. If you have a mic, and we will unmute you, for those of you in the, um, our remote locations. Or go ahead, if you don't have a mic, go ahead and type in a, your question into the chat box. And we do have someone monitoring those. Um, and it, I suppose I'll let anybody who's here ask a question too. But <laughs> um, OK. Thank you for asking me to talk this morning. Um, as the theme for this meeting is collaboration across libraries, I've titled my session today, Let's Work Together. And I'm going to talk a little bit about how the Commission helps libraries work together. So what does the Commission do? Let me make sure I can move this correctly. There we go. What does the Commission do in general? Well, our mission statement is a little lengthy. <laughs> a couple sentences, but lots of words. What I'm going to focus on is that we advocate for the library and information service needs of all Nebraskans. Okay? The Library Commission provides services to Nebraska residents in a variety of ways. We are basically the library for state agencies, state employees. We also provide libraries across the state with library development help. Um, we help provide technology access and other kinds of services. We provide reference service backup to libraries and we also answer any, any reference question from anyone that is related to Nebraska state government, Nebraska publications, and things of that type. We also provide the talking book and braille service to Nebraska residents. But as I um, said, we do help libraries help their own patrons. And one of the ways that we do that is through Nebraska Access. And I'll just give it, uh, for those who, of you who might have printed out the handout from the website, my presentation doesn't match exactly. I didn't put in all of the screenshots, but you'll be able to follow along here, okay? With Nebraska Access, over 1,000 libraries around Nebraska have passwords that they can give to their patrons to access these databases. The databases are available to all Nebraska residents, whether they log in with a password or whether they log in with their state um, driver's license, which they can use at home. <clears throat> and you'll notice that they, these resources are in pretty heavy demand. These are the statistics from 2010. Our full text databases, Wilson OmniFile alone had over 600,000 searches in just one year. So there is a need out there. Okay? But today, I'm going to focus a little bit more on some of those services or some of those things that we do that provide libraries with opportunities to share resources, ideas, and activities amongst themselves. Okay. For example, no library can purchase absolutely everything that their patrons want. And our patrons can be very demanding at times. But one of the things that we can use to um, supplement our own collection is interlibrary loan. Very often another library has the material that our patron wants and we can get them get that material for them. Now the Library Commission used to be play a much greater role in interlibrary loan when we were the OCLC network knee base for Nebraska. That role has gone away, but we still do support interlibrary loan um, through lender compensation and we do the interlibrary, we fill interlibrary loan requests, file them with OCLC for the small libraries around Nebraska. Now when we, when we submit those requests, we always go to Nebraska libraries first because we know that Nebraska libraries are very responsive. The only problem is, there is a good and a bad here, <laughs> the only problem is that you, have, you all have raised expectations so high that when a library, one of these small libraries, wants an item that's not available from a Nebraska library and we have to go out of state, it takes longer to get the item and they're saying, hey, how come I don't have it yet? <laughs> so, but as you can see, um, 
in fiscal year um, 2010, which, and I always get these backwards. Anyway, it's from June, uh, from July through June, there were over 50,000 items that were borrowed by one Nebraska library from another Nebraska library. With lender compensation, we paid out to those libraries that did lend those materials over $165,000. Now, we cannot guarantee that that type of funding will continue because of the budget cuts that are being proposed by the legislature. We may not have the money to do that in the future, or at least maybe not as much. But we do feel that, we have felt that it's been very important to provide that funding to help cover the costs because there are postage costs, there are staffing costs to you know, pull those materials and send those materials. So that's one way that Nebraska libraries help other Nebraska libraries. Another program that has started a little bit more recently is the Nebraska Book Club Kits Sharing Wiki. Okay? And um, for those of you here in Lincoln and those of you in Omaha, we did have, or we do have some bookmarks that um, promote this particular service. Book clubs we know are very, very popular, and of course most libraries, sm the smaller libraries especially, cannot afford to purchase multiple copies of the same title. Sometimes libraries do ask other libraries to loan them a copy just for the time period of the book club discussion, but we also have been um, collecting fiction, mostly fiction books, here at the Library Commission to loan out to libraries who have book clubs. And we've encouraged libraries, and several public libraries have um, added their materials, as well as the systems, to the book club wiki. You can see there are a number of popular titles as well as classic titles. Any library in Nebraska that, that has multiple copies that they're willing to loan out for book clubs, are welcome to um, add those uh, titles to this page. Okay? It is very popular. We send out um, four or five book club kits um, every few days here at the commission. Okay. Another way libraries can work together when they can't afford a service is to form consortia. Okay? Overdrive is a service that allows libraries to download audiobooks or allows patrons to download audiobooks and ebooks. Okay? Now, in Nebraska, and I see <laughs> a couple of people here um, who are participating in the consortia as well as um, libraries that aren't. Lincoln Cities and Omaha were precluded from this particular consortia. Overdrive would not allow them to join. Um, our group, but all we have 64 other libraries currently part of this group with two more joining shortly. And this is good when um, libraries can't afford services. And Overdrive as a service um, charges a maintenance fee of $12,000 a year, which the Library Commission currently pays. And then each of the libraries that's part of the consortia pays uh, an amount each month that goes totally towards purchasing content. Currently, um, there are over 3,000 audiobooks that are available through this group and over 1,200 ebooks. Okay, the audiobooks have been available for three years now and there have been over 103,000 circulations of the audiobooks. Now, no one library could buy all 3,000 books plus um, pay a maintenance fee. Okay? With the e-books, um, the e-books became available just this past July, and there have been over 8,000 circulations of those. So it's quite a popular service. There's high demand. Um, and getting together as a group can really help with the funding. Okay. Another way we can help with the buying power is through group discounts. We offer a lot of products from various vendors 
they may be databases, they may be particular software programs, they may be books or supplies. If you come through us, you, ought, you will usually get some type of a discount. It varies anywhere from between 5% to 60%. Okay? Some examples of where you, you know, the buying power really helps are with OCLC products. The CAD Express and Web Dewey groups really benefit from buying as part of a group. With CAD Express, if you purchased individually, you wouldn't have all of the options to buy just the particular number of records that, you, that your library needs. Okay? Um, another example is Learn a Test. Because we had a large enough group of libraries initially purchase that, we got a really good discount, and libraries that um, join that group in purchasing that continue to get that discount. We do the negotiating with the vendors. We do trials every once in a while. If you're on our trial listserv, um, you can certainly uh, take part in it, the trials of any of those products. Take a look at them before you actually plunk down your money. Um, and we also do the invoicing and renewals. Okay, so instead of instead of paying, you know, ten different vendors, you just pay us one one invoice usually, so it helps. Um, just to give you an idea of how much, how um, many libraries participate in these group discounts, in the last fiscal year, 193 libraries purchased 215 unique resources. Not all 193 bought 215, but totally there were 769 subscriptions. So we invoiced libraries over two and a half million dollars. And that two and a half million dollars would probably be closer to five thousand if it wasn't for the discounts that we that we helped get on those. Okay. A slightly different way that we can help libraries um, share resources is through a project called Nebraska Memories. Okay, it's a database of digital items. A number of libraries around the state have participated, and We've helped in that uh, with a lot of these libraries. They've, some of them have worked on their own, but others have worked in conjunction with other entities, be they historical societies, museums, or students. We have had several UNO students who, as their special projects, have done digitization um, of items for us. They've worked with the Omaha Public Library. They've worked with the Allegiant Emanuel Health Center. They've worked with the Omaha Community Playhouse. I'm trying to remember all of these. So there's a variety of ways that um, Nebraska Memories has helped get people entities involved with, with each other and brought in fresh people, new students, to work on these types of things. If you haven't already looked at the Nebraska Memories website, I really do encourage you. This is the front page. You, you'll notice that there are options for searching and browsing. Under the browsing, you can see that we do have 30 different collections currently. We have over 5,000 images. <clears throat> Excuse me. And we have found that not only is this helpful for getting collections out to um, people all over the world to access, and we do get comments from all over the world, um, it also helps libraries, media centers, schools here in Nebraska. We have talked with teachers and media specialists when we've gone to conferences, and they all comment on how they appreciate the fact that Nebraska Memories is, number one, a safe place for children to go for images. Um, and a lot of uh, projects that children do nowadays require that they get images from somewhere. The boys especially like all the athletic pictures, and we have a lot of them from the turn turn of the previous century, late 1800s, early 1900s, and it is baseball season, right? <laughs> um, and the other thing is th that helps the um, school teachers, especially third grade and fourth grade, is that they can use these pictures for local history in third grade and state history in fourth grade. We would really like to expand 
the our collections and the types of materials we have in here. Um, we don't have as many materials from the western side of the state as we would like, but we have some, and we're getting there. We are working with with other people um, out there, and of course, genealogists love to have pictures and resources. So, um, with the um, partnerships, we have also helped with funding by giving grants. We do pay for the software subscription for the Content DM. That's the software that houses the images and the metadata records. And we provide the server space, so everything is stored here, at least for what goes up on the internet. Um, and we provide personnel to help with training and actually doing some digitization projects if they're small, just to get libraries started. And it really helps to promote the, the libraries and their collections. Okay. We, as I mentioned, we have given grants for projects. Nebraska Memories projects have received library improvement grants. As, and as I said, we really, really encourage partnerships. Several of those grants went to um, partnerships between public libraries and museums or historical societies. Um, we've also given grants to groups who have done projects such as in, um, instituting, I guess I would say, um, ILSs. The Pioneer Group right now is working on putting in the COHA system, a catalog, cataloging system, CERC system, for a number of libraries around Nebraska. Um, at one point, I'm not quite sure how the... Um, Nebraska Association of Institutional Libraries actually was a group of the, the institutional libraries that got together and wrote a grant for an, um, an automated system five years ago, seven years ago, something like that. Ten years ago? Okay. It's been a little while ago. <laughs> but we do, um, we do give grants, uh, library improvement grants, to um, group projects. If libraries work together, it helps everybody. Youth grants are another source of funding that can help libraries work together. Um, in the past, we, for example, gave grants to um, Arapahoe and Valentine Public Libraries. They brought in a, um, an author, John Erickson, who presented Hank the Cowdog in concert, <laughs> and they shared um, transportation expenses and um, lodging expenses and, and other fees. Um, continuing education grants. We've had comments back um, from people who have gotten continuing education grants on how um, those grants have helped them um, in connecting with other people who do similar jobs. And in fact, we had one person who um, got a grant and actually drove to the conference with librarians from another grant. And she said just driving in the car, talking to those people, was worth as, almost as much as taking in the sessions at the conference, because you get to share ideas, share problems, come up with solutions together. Okay? Continue, or I did that. Internship grants. Yes, there's a question. Oh, sure, I'm sorry. It's memories.ne.gov. Okay. Um, okay, internship grants. We've just started a new round, a three-year um, internship grant round with funding from the IMLS, plus we have applied for grants from another foundation in conjunction with the Nebraska Library Association. Um, the, the application uh, deadline passed, so um, no one can ask for more funding this year, but there will be two more years of application opportunities. Okay? One of the things that the, the Library Commission commissioners really wanted to promote this time around was partnerships with those internships. So if your library maybe doesn't have enough to um, 
involve a student to work for you for you know, enough to use up $1,000, which is the, the maximum amount of the grant, you can always look around, see if you can strike up a partnership with someone else. Perhaps you're, you could use that extra help during the summer, and a school could use extra help during the school year. If you um, made a joint application, you'd get extra points, basically. Okay. And as I have mentioned, too, the funding for um, the grants that we give comes from a variety of sources. We do get federal LSTA funds that we use for these grants, but we also do apply for grants to other organizations. And we work with other orga organizations to get these grants, for example, the Nebraska Library Association. Okay. One more grant. <laughs> Broadband Technology Opportunities Program. This is a grant that we wrote um, because we have the support of the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation. This is um, funding from stimulus uh, monies. And to get the grant, we did have to put up matching funds. We, don't ha we did not have those funds, but the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation was very kind enough to step forward and actually gave us about 30% of the funding for the total grant. The other 70% did come from the um, federal government, from the ARA funds. We are working with 147 library buildings around the state, and that's all from the Panhandle all the way to the east. There are actually 140 libraries because we had several branches in both Omaha and in Lincoln. We are helping those libraries to improve their public computer centers. Some of those libraries are getting new replacement computers for old computers. Some of those libraries are getting additional computers because their demand is so high that they need more computers to serve their population. Some of those libraries are also um, having their broadband uh, access, their broadband speed increased too as part of this um, project. We will be doing a lot of training across the state in these new, uh, I want to call it PCCs, public computer centers. We, um, are in, we will encourage those libraries to do training um, together. We've already talked to some libraries who plan to do their marketing together to promote these new uh, computer centers. And um, we are working with partners. Uh, the State uh, De Labor Department of Labor, the University, um, UNMC, various other partners to provide training not only to the staff but to patrons. Okay? And libraries can work together to, you know, with all kinds of ideas for this particular project. Yes, Janet. With all of your materials going out to libraries, have they gotten, will every public library in Nebraska have an internet access computer? Okay, the question was, with all these new computers going out, will every public library in Nebraska have computers, have internet access? The answer is no. <laughs> there are still some small libraries that do not, do not and will not have internet access for one reason or another. Yes? But it's gone from this, if you raise the percentage of how many, it's quite a bit. Well, we, we actually, and maybe Richard can help me out with this, but I don't believe we are putting computers into any library that did not have computers before. Okay. But we... Yeah, we're improving the equipment and the connections. We're, there's over a thousand computers that will go out, both desktops and laptops. There are printers and projectors and scanners. Um, ADA workstations, and if, <clears throat> excuse me, sorry, just one sec. <clears throat> and if the computers are additional computers, the libraries were also offered furniture 
because, you know, where are you going to put that extra desktop if you don't have something to put it on? So, yeah. And we have, um, we actually hired three staff with the funding through this grant to manage the grant because 147 libraries is a fair, fairly large number to work with. Um, we have a project manager and we have an IT manager who will actually be installing, helping some of these libraries install equipment. Not everybody needs help, but those that do, Holly will be going out. And then the, our third person is the grants compliance officer because, you know, with federal funding, you have to watch how every penny is spent and we've got at least two auditors looking over our shoulders. So we have to make sure that we document absolutely everything. So, a lot of work for that. Okay. Any other questions? Okay. Oops. Go the right way here. Okay. Summer reading program. <clears throat> this is where um, we help libraries in Nebraska actually work with libraries all around the country. The Collaborative Summer Reading Pro, Summer Library Program, I always mess that up. Sally's always correcting me. It's Summer Library Program, is actually run by 49 states, two territories, and Washington, D.C. So you're getting ideas for your summer reading program from experts all over the country. You not only get the ideas and the programming, but you also get great discounts on any kind of materials that you want to buy to go along with your program. And you can contribute. Sally Snyder um, has, ha, has recently sent out, um, earlier this month, she sent out a request for people to submit their ideas for future themes. And I didn't write it down. I don't remember what the theme is for this year. I always mess that up. That's right. It's One World, Many Stories for Children, and You Are There for Teens. Mm -hmm. okay. So if you have any um, ideas for, <clears throat> for other themes, you know, speak up if you have some great ideas. And I know every year, it's, uh, it always amazes me, a lot of people, um, well, I shouldn't say a lot, several libraries almost every year apply for the youth grants. And I always say youth grants, and it's actually youth Ex, ex, excellent, youth Grants for Excellence. I, we abbreviate things around here too much. <laughs> youth Grants for Excellence. Um, they apply for funding to help them with their programming for their summer reading. And some of the ideas are just so innovative. And you, it's amazing how people will take the same theme and go in totally opposite directions with it. But they make it fun for their kids. And... You know, if you're, you start from the same point, it's always helpful to have that initial idea and then use your own creativity. Okay? Okay. Encompass Live. Um, that is our Wednesday morning webinar. It's normally held at 10 o'clock. It's on all different kinds of topics. Many times the presenter is somebody here from the Library Commission, but we do really encourage outside guest presenters. And we have been fortunate enough to have presenters from our Nebraska libraries. And they have covered all different types of topics. For programming, um, Carol Swanson and Katherine Kelly from Lincoln City Libraries talked about the One Book, One Lincoln program. Manya Shore and Amy Mather from the Omaha Public Library talked about serving the underserved professionals in their community with a program that they have called Have Lap Laptop Will Travel, Speed Dating and Board Silly at Your Library. I think those were three, I'm sorry, those were three different programs, but they talked about them all at the same time. Um, as far as resources go, just last week, week before. Marta McGee talked about healthy kid resources. And I'm going to advance this because you can see some of the different programs that we've had. Um, also, 
resources, Gail Roberts and Wendy Lukert from the Blair Public Library did a program on collections for your community, tools, cake pans, toys. And others have reported what they've learned at various conferences. Just yesterday, our own Michael Sowers reported from Computers and Libraries, which was held in Washington, D.C. this week. Um, and he dragged people in from the hallway <laughs> to talk about what they were learning and what people were talking about at that conference. So there are a lot of different ways to participate to help out your fellow librarians across Nebraska. If you have great ideas about programming, resources, something that you would like to do, something that you have done, please feel free to contact Krista Burns here at the Commission and, say, and volunteer and say, I will do a program for you. I'll, I want to tell everybody the wonderful success that we had. Okay? <clears throat> and for those who can't attend live on Wednesday mornings, as you see here, we do have um, an archived uh, page where you can watch recordings of all those sessions. And we do keep statistics on who watches the recordings and they are watched a fair number. We know that, you know, no one time works for everybody, which is why we record the sessions and make them available. Okay, another way we are trying to encourage libraries to work together um, is through a sense of community, okay? Um, a number of library staff took place in um, the 23 Things, which then became Nebraska Learns 2.0. We put up a technology topic, one topic each month, and people are encouraged to um, do the topic, post a blog to their own uh, blog site, and also comment on other people's blogs. If you go out and read what other people have been doing and comment, it makes it creates more of a sense of community and it gets a conversation going about how libraries are using these new technologies, maybe what's not working so well, um, but it it always helps to talk with other people. Okay, another way that we're trying to create something of a community is through an installation of WordPress. And I should have put up the, the other portion of this. We are using WordPress software to offer um, library websites to Nebraska libraries. And it's called Nebraska Libraries on the Web, which is what I should have put up here, and I didn't. Um, Michael Sowers is our support person for that. At the moment, we have been working mostly with test libraries. Um, we started with libraries who did not currently have a web page at all. We are now testing um, some video online training um, because I know everybody's budget's getting really tight on travel. So since we have the, um, the option of doing video recordings, Michael has done a whole series on how to customize each part of WordPress to set up a, a website for your library. That will be opening up probably next month to any public library across the state. Um, the only thing that we do ask is that the library does post at least one blog post to the main web page once a week. Okay, And some people go, oh no, writing a blog post. Back up a minute. Don't you want to announce that you have some new books? Don't you want to announce your summer reading program? Don't you want to announce you've got a pro, um, something else going on at the library? That's all you have to put up for a blog post. And we only ask that you put up a blog post once a week because we want people to see your um, website as being new every time they go in. You don't want just a static site. If they log in, see, hey, you have a new note. There's something, maybe a picture or something that's different from the last time that they looked at your page. They'll be more likely to come back and look at your page just to see what's going on. Okay? And with that, <clears throat> we do have a main site where um, people can put comments and, again, create that sense of community, say what's working for them, what's not working for them. Um, 
we have, um, you, you do have the option to choose from a number of different themes that create the look of the web page. You're not limited to just one look so that every library looks exactly the same. So you might say, hey, I tried this theme and boy did it turn out lousy. <laughs> or you might say, this one's just so wonderful, you know, I customized it and did this and did that. Um, we've had libraries who said, oh, you know, we had a local photographer who ran right out and took a beautiful picture for me so that I could put it up as a banner on my website. So that's just another way to, you know, help libraries do something in their library, but also work with other libraries around the state to improve their services and their their programming. Okay. And I must be, hmm, I hope people have some questions. I must be talking faster than I had expected. I tend to do that. But you won't complain if I end up early anyway, will you? Um, <clears throat> another way that um, libraries can work together is through their regional systems. We have six regional library uh, system administrators that go out and work with libraries one-on-one. -on -one. But the systems also provide opportunities for libraries to share ideas and programming, to, to do a lot of networking. You can volunteer to serve on their boards. You can um, attend, well, a lot of people <laughs> attend their uh, meetings that they have for library directors, for children's librarians, youth services librarians. Um, they offer a number of different training opportunities. And it's always great. We always get comments. People say a good part of the meeting that's beneficial to them is talking with the other librarians during breaks, during lunch hearing what's going on in other places. And the systems um, are funded by us to about 95% of their budget. Okay. So if you would like to participate in any of the activities that I talked about this morning, um, you can contact us. You can check out our website for more information. Um, give us a call. We'd really like to talk with you if you have new ideas about how you think we can help you work together to share resources, to share programming, to do training, whatever. Okay? Yes, we have a question at the back. Um, when you were talking about Oh, no, I, other resources? I didn't mention that. The, um, the comment was about the book club sharing <laughs> wiki that I, that I talked about. The book club kits that are listed on that wiki that belong to the Library Commission, um, when they are sent out to libraries, we also include a list of discussion questions and um, sometimes a little bit of information about the author. Um, so there are extra resources that go out with the books. Yes? Because we have a little time, is it possible for you to go and show them the website of the Sure. Do you want me to do it for you? Or you okay. <laughs> I'll let J Janet run the computer and I'll talk, if she'll let me. As long as the camera's on you, I'm happy. Okay. I'll just say Marguerite and Carolyn didn't take enough time at the beginning. That's why I'm running fast. <laughs> <laughs> yes. <laughs> Wouldn't want to go over it, right? <laughs> Is this the one we're talking about? Right? Okay. Yes. Right. And with this, if you get um, a book, if you borrow a book club kit and your discussion group absolutely hated it or absolutely loved it or found, you know, the characters wonderful, you have the option to come in here and leave comments for other people to see, too. Does 
So the, the question is what's the exact question? Pro probably. Um, oh, hang on. I know. I think I know. Sure. We're going to share the mic here. We have a little bit of time because we're supposed to last till you know ten till and maybe a little further. And so I just wanted to, in addition to the book club sharing wiki that Deborah had talked about, if it happens to be one of the book club kits that you get from the library commission, just bear with me a second. Now you could also go to the library commission website that lists just the commission book club kits. And I'm not trying to highlight the commission one any more than the others, but if it's one of the books from ours, we will also have some of the, um, let me find one, other information about it. There's a reading guide for this one in particular. There's information about the movie that goes with this. There is reviews, that kind of thing. And it also tells you how many copies that the book has in case your book club is 12 or 15, you don't want to get one, get a kit that's only two books. Just some additional information. I was going to show something else if that's okay. Okay. And I know Deborah chatted a lot about Nebraska memories and pictures and I wanted to bring up on our commission website, we have a blog and one of the things that Several of the people that work with Nebraska Memories has been doing. I'm not in the camera you anymore. To, you want me to? I'll just talk about this there one then. Go. Okay. Um, <laughs> we started publicizing Nebraska Memories a little bit more, trying to promote it here a, about a month ago. So we've been writing a blog entry a week about some special feature about Nebraska Memories. Um, the, I guess we started last month because we, we did one for Lincoln's birthday. I should say I did one for Abraham Lincoln's birthday. Um, and then we did one featuring the Capitol for Legislative Day. Um, Emily did one last week about grocery, sh grocery shopping. Um, you know, the inside of the, uh, a butcher shop from the 1890s compared to the inside of a, a little grocery store um, in the 1940s, you know, with little ladies dressed up all fan, you know, in their best, pushing little shopping carts. So you know how things change over the years. But um, we also did one um, at the beginning of the month to feature um, pictures about women for Women's History Month. We're going to try to feature something that relates to things that are going on. And um, actually this week, I'm not sure if Alana has it up yet or not. Um, she was featuring the tornado <laughs> pictures from, oh, there you go, from um, the Omaha Public Library. It's the 1913 uh, tornado that actually the, the anniversary was yesterday, right, Marguerite? I believe, yeah, 23rd, yeah. So, um, this is one way to promote Nebraska libraries, but we also find that when we do this, in most of the blogs, you'll find pictures, uh, links to pictures that cross a number of different collections. Um, we might sometimes just fe feature one particular uh, picture. Um, we also did scores. Carolyn Dow is sitting in the front row here from Lincoln City Library's Poly Music Library, and she and Linda Helfman did a lot of work um, digitizing musical scores from their collection as well as concert programs and other materials related to Lillian Polly who who originally funded that particular collection. So there's a lot of different things that um, that libraries and school libraries can use in that particular database. So um, do you want to check, Janet, if there are any questions before we wrap up? Yes. So, yes. Yes, you can friend the commission on Facebook. Please do. We also um, have, um, we host <laughs> um, the 
site for the Nebraska Center for the Book, which you can also host, and I'll, I'll promote I'll, um, the book festival that is that we do a lot of work on for the Nebraska Center for the Book will be held here in Lincoln on May 21st. It's a Saturday. It'll be downtown. Please join us. And we had, was there another hand that I see? Um, we, we do ask that the requests for the book clubs come from libraries. So we would ask that your book club go to you and you ask us for those. But anybody can look at our website to see those. But if you would like to put a link on your page to say, you know, hey, here's some book club kits, contact me if you're interested, that's perfectly fine too. Um, I'm not, I have to admit I haven't seen that on any web, on any library's web page, if they, how they're promoting that. Yeah. Well, well, I, it, it could be a lot of the library clubs actually meet at their local libraries and they talk to the librarians and the librarians have said, oh, well, you know, here are some more, um, options for different titles for different ways to get the books. Right, yeah. And we're trying to promote it a little bit more too with these bookmarks. You know, if you're interested, we can sure share the, um, excuse me, share the template to make more bookmarks to hand out in your library if you would be interested in that. Sure. Richard, did you have a question? Right, right, right. Yes, libraries do put out requests over the um, their regional library li their systems uh, listserv asking for extra copies of titles because of book discussion groups. Okay, anything else? Well, thank you very much, and I hope I gave you some ideas. As I said, let's work together. Call us if you want to participate in anything or if you have any questions. Okay, thanks. Thank you, Deborah. We're going to take a short break and start promptly at 11. And um, if there are any questions, any technical difficulties, um, any comments you want to make, uh, please call 402-471-4035. See you at 11.
We're back. I'd like to introduce Maureen O'Reardon of Coley Jessen and Mary Stoltz of Baird Home. They're going to speak about the law firm librarian. Good morning. I'm Mary Stoltz. This is Maureen O'Reardon. We work in Omaha at two different law firms. I work at Baird Home. I work at Coley Jessen, and we are very happy to have this opportunity to talk to you about the profession and the importance of uh, paraprofessionals in our law libraries. Um, we will be providing you with an overview of the law firm environment uh, and talk about the paraprofessional in the law firm library and the duties and responsibilities of the law librarian. Um, I might need some technical assistance here when I, oh. yes, I was, I was pressing it. It worked earlier. Oh. <laughs> it's not working now. Yes. Just a second. Let me check my little buttons. Okay. Now try again. Thank you. We will discuss the necessity of collaboration and networking with other libraries and organizations. We will include anecdotes about our work without discussing any confidential information. Names are not used to protect confidentiality. And feel free to ask questions anytime. Each law firm is uh, very different, <laughs> varies in size, administration, staffing, culture, and practice areas. Uh, of course, the best law firms employ librarians or information specialists. Our firms are similar in some ways, but very different in other ways. Um, for example, uh, Coley Jessen is a West Omaha location, uh, which factors into its culture. It's also a younger firm, having just opened its doors in 1988. There are 50 attorneys. It's a general practice firm. Um, practice areas include banking, finance, and creditors' rights, general business, employment, benefits, and labor, estate and business succession planning, health law, intellectual property, including trademark and copyright protection litigation, M&A, securities, real estate, environmental, and tax. Uh, we generally don't handle a lot of family or criminal law unless there are matters for existing clients. Um, I've been at Coley Jessen since 2001. Uh, right now, I'm working part-time, as is the library assistant. Uh, for six years in the 1990s, uh, I was a librarian at a large um, international firm that had over 400 attorneys, 250 of them were in the New York City office where I worked. Uh, the culture was very different there. Uh, it was always fast-paced. Uh, spending was much less conservative, and personalities were extremely demanding pretty much across the board. Uh, working in a law firm comes with certain pressures. Uh, and requires the ability to be able to uh, handle urgent requests. But in Omaha and Nebraska, uh, I found that there's much more regard for people's personal lives and families. So. And I'm with All right. Is it? <laughs> Thank you. And I'm employed with a firm founded in 1881. There are 75 lawyers in this firm, and it is led by a managing partner and executive committee. I report to a library partner and a legal administrator, and I've job shared my position the last 17 years. My job sharing partner is Ann Baumgartner, and uh, we've shared this work arrangement for quite some time. The Ann works four days a week, so I'm able to get out on some days, like today. And I work um, three days a week, and we overlap two days. We have two part-time assistants, and our attorneys practice in many of the areas that Maureen described, but they practice in civil law, 
and that includes banking and finance, bankruptcy, business, tax, estate planning, corporate, education, environmental affairs, and legislative services, health care, employment, litigation, real estate, securities, and intellectual property, and all the subsections that would come underneath those areas. It's, a, it's always very interesting um, every day at the firm. Any type of question can come up at any time. Our collection contains the leading treatises, current awareness materials, and primary materials to support the firm practice areas. We're located downtown on five floors of the Woodman Tower, and we are near the county and federal courthouses. Time is income. And the lawyers provide uh, clients. <laughs> the lawyers provide clients with accurate, timely, and result-oriented legal advice and representation. They apply the law and solve legal challenges. The law can changes daily because of new legislation, new regulations, and court opinions. For example, the Nebraska legislature introduced nearly 700 bills this year. And as of March 22nd, 97 became law, or will become law soon. Attorneys do not um, always go to court either. They work with clients to be compliant with laws and regulations. Um, an example of something that constantly changes that affects the work of the attorneys, uh, if you think of all those notification letters with the small print that you receive in the mail from insurance companies, telephone companies, credit card, and energy companies or utilities. Uh, these letters are required by law, uh, are sent to you, and that's a requirement by law, to ensure that you've been notified of, um, of your rights and any changes to the regulations. So not only do the attorneys have to be up to date on uh, if they're representing any of these industries, be up to date on the law so that they can amend any of these notification letters. I think they're, they're writing it as well as having to uh, be aware of it as well. Okay, and one of the ways we kind of monitor how much we're spending on our li library for our legal research materials as other firms are spending on theirs is um, looking at data. And this data is from the American Association of Law Libraries Salary Survey, Average Information Budget per Attorney. And I always find it very interesting because if I look at this chart and 100 lawyers um, on this chart, it may show that per lawyer a law firm might spend uh, in the mid-range $7,000 per lawyer for materials. So if you have 100 lawyers, um, you can see it's quite an investment. And there is a range in um, data on this chart. But um, the research materials cost money. And this is table 33. And, um, um, and there's other charts like this that I also find very interesting for us to kind of gauge where we are in the whole um, uh, cost aspect of having a law library and staff in a law firm and staffing a law library. Um, and information budget usually includes the, the books, serials, and electronic resources ordered and processed as part of the law library. Um, costs vary from firm to firm. Uh, for example, uh, tax, and, tax and labor practices, in particular, uh, need materials that are updated frequently because of so many changes to the laws and regs. Um, so if your practice is limited to tax or labor, that's all you need. Uh, if you have a general practice firm, like our firms, um, you need to get materials from all of the practice areas so that the more research materials, the more expense to the firm. So, and I'm going to, I will point out on this slide, oops, wrong way, I, I wanted to point out on here, I was going by this me, uh, medium number for um, law firm totals, but if you look in the minimum, some law firms are spending, they're reporting spending less per attorney, and some are spending um, a little more per, per attorney. So there's, oh, there's quite a range in the um, rate, and that may be because some of the firms are only practicing in one area, so they're not having to buy materials to cover all the practice areas that we cover. 
Uh, the library professionals add value to the law firm's investment in resources. Uh, it's a constant challenge to uh, communicate your value to the organization, um, but it's important to promote the library function, the library professionals, um, and advocate the needs for the firm. Um, and at the same time, you're just busy doing your job. Library professionals' management of a collection adds value to an investment in books and databases. We make the resources work for the firm. We manage renewals, subscriptions, updating, password access, and who needs what materials and what materials are the most useful for the firm's practice areas. We monitor changes in format and content of materials and make recommendations for cancellations and purchases. Paraprofessionals are valuable to the law firm library. This is a job description for paraprofessionals in academic libraries. It was written by the American Association of Law Libraries. This is an international association um, that we often use as a resource. Um, and it's comprised of librarians from law firms, academic law libraries, and government law libraries. Uh, some of the things included, uh, it says, this position provides support to the basic functions of the library. Um, responsibilities may include any combination of the following. Provide guidance to library users on library policies and procedures. Order and process invoices for new materials. Maintain subscriptions communicate with outside suppliers, and, and so on. Um, the position really requires someone who can give attention to detail uh, and, and manage multiple tasks and has basic computer skills. Um, law firm library positions, uh, paraprofessional positions, are very similar to this, uh, it's, except there would probably be greater variety and additional responsibilities as a res result of just having a smaller staff in general. And staff um, in the law firm environment must comply with ethics rules uh, related to confidentiality and the unauthorized practice of law. Salaries for paraprofessionals also vary. There's a range in salaries because of a variety of responsibilities in an in a environment. These figures are from the Occupational Outlook Handbook Employment Statistics. The medium hourly wage is $12 for clerical assistance. For paraprofessionals, the hourly wage is $15 according to this chart. Midwestern salaries, as compared to the coasts, are usually lower because our cost of living is lower. lower. And if you, I don't, you might not be able to see the chart, and I'm not supposed to turn around, but <laughs> okay. But but it, that does that does show like the the minimum, the maximum, and the medium, and those are things that our law firm would look at when they were going to hire um, for that position. I have a question. Yes. Law. No, no. <laughs> you'd be trained. You'd be trained on the job. But we have worked with um, Creighton to allow our staff, if they were interested, in to um, audit a, like general research class or basic um, legal classes at Creighton University. I don't know if any. I don't recall that anyone actually did that. But we would allow them to do that and give them the time to do that if they were so interested in that. Um, in, in our firm, with just the two of us, and we're both working part-time, uh, I know the library assistant sometimes gets asked questions that she really, um, she likes the variety, but she really has not worked with materials a lot, and she doesn't have access to some of the online services where you'd go to pull up some of this, these things. So sometimes there's... Um, it's not required. Any any knowledge, you know, is beneficial, uh, in, especially in our 
in, in my situation. But, um, but yeah, really, and it really depends on the size of the staff that you're working with, I think. Uh, in the law firm library, uh, most paraprofessional, paraprofessionals do the following. Uh, processing the library's mail. Uh, many titles come in the mail, but they also arrive electronically via email, and sometimes they need to be retrieved off periodically off of websites. After processing, there's the check-in of the titles, which ensures that we're getting what we paid for and getting it to the lawyers and or on the shelf. Materials need to be filed in order. In an update or if an update or issue does not arrive, it is requested or claimed from the publisher. That's usually a requirement of a paraprofessional staff. Filing should be timely, and the goal is to get the new materials on the shelf within the day or two of its arrival. The card sets are, are generated from our software program, and that's usually um, a duty of a paraprofessional staff. And the materials are collected from our return areas, checked in, and reshelved. And I also utilize paraprofessionals' um, special talents. So if they happen to be in an MLA, MLA program at UNO, or they um, have an interest in blogging, or they have an interest in, in technology, then I, I will utilize those strengths. For example, um, because of their interest in technology, they helped us build our research tools portal on our intranet at the firm. And our, I mentioned that um, we do use software to manage our library. We do have an online catalog. And this is a screenshot of my uh, first page of the catalog in the software format. Uh, Maureen and I both use InMagic DB TextWorks software. We use the software to, cr to create an online database to search our collection. And there's a check-in database to manage the collection. Check-in is automated, and the library catalog is online, and there's also a, um, a web version of the catalog at, at my location. And this um, screenshot um, at the very top is our, uh, when you click on that, you'll get into a menu for doing a search in the catalog, which will show the person that's doing the search where the book is located. And I don't have just one uh, physical library space. There's four floors of uh, where books could be, and uh, so it's how I need to do that too because sometimes our collections have to be shifted around and moved to different floors, and I, I only remember where they were 17 years ago. And then there's check-in um, database that um, will allow us to manage when things are coming in and out. And then I have an index of ethics opinions um, in our collection, and the record, to the records are attached, the actual full text, but they're also indexed. And then OPS Experts is a, a, where I've collected materials about um, educational professionals and um, what they've written about, what they've testified about, and that's um, searchable. And then we track legislation for our attorneys, and this al allows us to um, it allows us to know who wants to know about what and how often uh, from the Nebraska legislature. An accounting and ordering database um, helps me manage our budget, and the research tools on the portal is built to then go um, provide a list of research databases that we use with the password information um, displayed so the attorneys can go there to see what it is that um, we have access to and what their passwords are. But we create that database on Imagic. Do the attorneys have you do a lot of their, you know, searching the databases because you know how to do the GAN search and that stuff? Or, or have you found that, you know, it's kind of a mix of you do it or they do the work? It, it's a mix. It is a mix. mix. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> there, are a lot, there are a lot of attorneys that like to do things themselves, and then there are others that, um, but this yeah, but this menu we find that probably mostly library staff actually go into the catalog to look for a book. They'll come into the library or call the library and ask, "Do we have any materials on a certain um, topic?" And so sometimes I catalog into the chapters um, 
and we were going to talk about that later, how our creative cataloging we have to do, but uh, so that so that we can find maybe up and coming um, areas and certain types of materials that we they may have not written really a, a treatise about, or we may not have felt like we could purchase that at this time. So um, we probably access this database more than they do, but we have some other um, collections and lists of databases that they go to to look to see what they can do searches in. Um, I don't, uh, this, is, this is a sample of a library check-in record from my firm. Um, most of our, the library probably gets more mail than any other area in the firm. Uh, so uh, once it's processed, we check it in. Um, this is a typical title that's routed to attorneys or paralegals or administrators. Uh, the record lists, the, we use initials a lot, so this record lists the people who want to be notified of updates or provided with uh, highlights pages or a table of contents pages or sometimes the original. The format and manner of routings varies depending on attorney preferences as well as uh, licensing and copyright um, considerations. In some instances, we're not allowed to copy anything from the publication, uh, so we have to route the original. Uh, this, uh, you know, the unfortunate thing is it not always comes back, but uh, generally we're allowed to uh, email a highlights page or a table of contents provided by the publisher. Uh, when we need to forward the hard copy, the system will print out the list for us and then we just attach it to the item and send it on its way. Uh, this, particular, um, this particular system allows us to move fields from the catalog record into the serials. So when we're checking in, I've sort of adapted this to what we'd like to see when we're checking something in, such as the frequency, um, and that's actually in the catalog record, not in the serials record things like the place, the location, uh, retention, and any other notes, uh, such as when it was last paid. It's possible it's something comes in and you don't remember seeing it, and it was something that was canceled a long time ago, and uh, they're just trying to get us back on the subscription. And so uh, it helps us figure out uh, what to do. It also offers note space, so if there's any specially, special handling procedures for any particular title, then it's all right there. Uh, it, it's important to get the materials out as quickly as possible. We generally route after the filing is completed, um, as long as it's getting out quickly. Sometimes that's not always the case, and uh, we, we send it out and then file. And in my library, when we're really trying to manage our costs and make our collection match what the practice area is, sometimes we use that check-in record to um, with notes in there that our assistant bring us any new editions of books or anything that a publisher sends out that's um, extra, you know, because you own this title, we thought you'd love to pay $700 for this title. And so we, um, instead of having her process it, some things are tagged, like we want to see everything that comes in. And sometimes we do things like um, only purchase an index every other year because we see that the attorneys aren't using the indexes. They usually know what section of um, the law they're going to. So um, we may not purchase the index every year and that check-in record allows us to tag that information that um, they won't automatically process it through that it'll come back to us and we can make a decision if it should be returned or not. So I find it very helpful to have that database and it's very easy to to change it, to change um, the routing order and things like that if, as needed. Um, I had a question, how hard is it to find material that's been routed? Somebody calls up and they need it and you have no idea where it is. Well, fortunately, we go to the list. First thing, we go to the list. And, um, you know, you get to know people pretty well and uh, 
Sometimes people will volunteer to be put on the bottom of the list because they know things sit for a while. So we do a lot of, uh, there's a certain amount of time spent tracking stuff down mm -hmm. in general. But um, yes, it's always a, always a challenge. But <laughs> um, the filing formats for legal publications um, include lo a lot of loose leaf binder sets. Um, and they're updated week, some, sometimes weekly, sometimes biweekly, sometimes monthly. Um, another format is called a pocket part. And uh, I don't know how unique this is to legal materials, but uh, what they do is um, a supplement is inserted in the back of the book, and it's a pocket is provided by the publisher in the book so that you can just slide in the updates. And then eventually this will get too fat, and they send you another volume that's twice as expensive. And, uh, and publishers have also started a trend, um, things that get annual updates. Uh, they've been reprinting entire volumes instead of uh, supplying you with the loose leaf pages to be filed. Um, another opportunity for financial gain. <laughs> and, rec and recently we received a, a notice that instead of getting a, a tax code and regulation set that we purchase every year, and it's, it's kind of, it's very large, um, they were going to send it to us on CD. And um, that wasn't going to work for our, for us, but other publishers were offering to step in to provide, you know, the paper copy that we might need. We do have access to that kind of information online, uh, but really um, when some of those materials just need to be uh, utilized in uh, print format. So that's an issue that came up and then we, we uh, saw that in our listserv and kept our eye up, out for it. <laughs> so, so we could make a decision too as to what we should do. All right, some filing is tedious. There's small print in the instructions and small print on the uh, edges where the page numbers are, the paragraph numbers are, are sometimes very closely formatted to page numbers. You're just not sure, it, am I supposed to be pulling out the paragraph number or the page number? And, you know, they'll replace just like um, 100 pages in here, but they won't all be together. You know, it's, it's, um, it requires attention to detail. And so that's a really important um, aspect of a professional, paraprofessional's job. Paper can be also rather thin and, and hard to handle. So even though we have um, an automated catalog, we also have a, a manual checkout system. Our books are not um, in Materials are not shelved in a contained space. There's no one entrance and one exit. Um, and so uh, with four floors and collections and, uh, and hallways, a tax library, a main library, titles do need to be tracked down. But they also, uh, somebody has to stop and fill out uh, a card, put their initials on it, and then someone on the staff will file it in our filing box. But that step doesn't always happen. And even when I bring people materials, I sometimes um, have to remind myself I need to check it out to them too. Um, this chart, um, it includes three months of statistics kept by myself and the library assistant. Um, it, it was an effort to determine where we were spending most of our time. I decided to combine uh, to, to combine our time because there are so many things that kind of overlap uh, between our jobs. Um, and as, but as every month is different for both of us, this was a combined average of our time. Certain months of the, the year you seem to get a lot of updates for publications. Uh, so this is for October, November, and December of 2008. Um, Let's see, filing is on the top of the list. It does take the greatest amount of time in general, just because uh, 
it's it's so specific and um, we both have to we'll both be notified if there are issues where things aren't consistent uh, and we it's just keeps us busy okay where am I do here? want to uh, well, okay well um, I think I already mentioned that okay but but, but um, okay so this is okay so then um, the next on the list is research requests and that this particular percentage of time includes everything from intensive research that I might handle to copy requests, tracking down books, um, you know, do you know who has this or uh, where can I find that? And we, we have a similar situation where we're on a couple of floors and a lot of materials are shelved in the hallways or in people's offices. And so you do find uh, yourself looking for things. Um, if we did this chart today, however, I don't think the percentage of time for filing would be uh, as high. Um, kind of about what we, what we mentioned earlier, there's a definite move from print to online resources in general, but uh, because it's not always the most cost-effective way or user-friendly way to do research, uh, books will not be extinct in law libraries. Is this where I was telling the story? Yeah, the oh, filing. Okay, okay. Well, and um, my um, previous law firm, not the Baird Home Law Firm, um, I, I had heard this story that before the library staff was responsible for updating the books, the um, other staff, maybe law clerks, were to do it, and we were they were at a down a different down they were at a downtown location, and they moved out west and. They found um, filings that hadn't been filed but hidden away in ceiling tiles and in different places. <laughs> and that impacted our collection, you know, it still impacted our collection when I left there in the 90s because you would be, some of these sets are, are just large and you'd be looking up something and there'd be, a, you could tell there was a gap. And so other librarians have the same issues, so we try to work with each other and the publisher, you know, to bring our sets current. But I think after that, then um, they saw that it was important to have library staff um, doing the updating, and because we do know how important it is to um, file on in order and actually do the filing. This is um, about skills for law firm library employment. And one of the, um, in the law firm library environment, we need a variety of skills. And we might turn to the American Association of Law Librarians core competencies to uh, describe those skills. The outline of the, of the um, skills are in the areas of library management, reference, research, information technology, collection development, cataloging, and teaching. For example, one um, skill is teaching, and it is effectively teaches library clients with different, differing needs and tech, <laughs> technological skill levels. That's one example. And then another one provides um, leadership, including negotiation and collaboration with relevant members of the organization to ensure that the library is vital to the parent organization. Okay. And you can go to um, a website at AALL, and, and we had handouts. I, I, I think you had to pull them off of the, um, the email you received, and it has an address there for AALL, and then you can see the the list of um, skills that are required. It's not really a job description, but it is, it could be a goal to um, make sure you learn how to do all aspects of your job. Um, the librarian as administrator, uh, our, our tasks um, include uh, scheduling staff, making online resources accessible, um, by working with outside vendors and internal IT departments, uh, monitoring the budget, working on departmental goals, handling purchases and renewals, 
We also train staff and attorneys and paralegals on library procedures and research services. Um, that involves usually one-to-one -one training at the point of need, but we do schedule group training and promote, uh, review, repro promote them attending review sessions. And I also um, take training continuously online, like go to meetings and webinars, so that um, I can stay up on the uh, newest computer-assisted research techniques. And I think of an example of using a cell phone or one of these that you might get, you might know basically how to answer your phone, but when you learn some of the other functions, and this is true in databases, and you adapt the ones that make you more efficient and more effective, then you do a better job um, with, with your job. And I think of it that way. There's always a level in these databases or even um, utilizing some of our research print books, too, that um, you can use to access it, but to actually get the most value out of it, it's, it's better to know about some of the advanced um, capabilities of the system. And we also do cataloging in our library, but we do it to a level that's appropriate for the organization. They would never say, I need to have a technical services department, you know, at the firm. That would not happen in our size firm in, in the Midwest. But um, wait, the, did you have a comment? Yes. Um, yes. Well, in the, in the New York firm I worked at, they did have a technical services department. Um, but they also... Uh, um, with the trend towards more online, again, it's, it's kind of affected cataloging as well as you probably know. Um, and our libraries are different, but she, they process cards and pockets uh, for the books. We don't, um, a, a lot of that is because a lot of our materials are in the hall, and at the time, uh, as a small firm, they kind of wanted people to stay together as a group, and it requires more communication to track things down when there's not a card and pocket in place. Mm -hmm. But we just do very basic um, cataloging, and then um, this the assistant will some, do some, but also um, mostly run the card sets to um, put in the new books and into the um, updated books. You have a question. So you're in charge of budgeting your own area, so you have to make purchases, and then the purchases are actually approved before you purchase them? Do they go through a committee and stuff like that? Um, this is about um, if there's a, an approval system for purchases, and af after the budget's already been decided. And ours, our system is rather loose. At one time, I reported to a library committee. Um, right now, I don't. But um, oftentimes, the requests for new publications come from the uh, come from the shareholders or the the person in charge of a particular practice group. So it more or less comes with approval. And uh, in my case, it's sort of a support for me because if at the end of the year I'm not within the budget, you know, I can point specifically to. A, a specific request. Um, and then other things happen too during a year. You might add a, start to do work in another practice area, so um, your budget's going to increase because you're going to have to get some additional research materials. Okay. Um, librarians are also timekeepers. So we bill any time spent working on client matters back to the client. Um, at rates determined by the firm uh, in agreement with the client. Uh, in addition, expenses derived from fee-based databases, online services, document retrieval services, the use of messengers, that is also generally billed back to the client as well. Um, fee -based, the major fee-based databases that we use in the legal online services, I should say. It's uh, Westlaw and Lexis. Um, those notebooks uh, were complimentary uh, from our uh, Westlaw representative. Um, other online databases that bill back are the 50 state or federal courts for different filings, 
um, administrative online databases and document retrieval services, interlibrary loan services and fees may also be billed back. Um, as a result, it's very important that we provide research in a manner that takes into consideration both time and expense to the client and firm. Um, the cost of materials, services, and time is always in our minds as we determine how we handle research. And it's really part of, I found it part of my job to have to um, assist attorneys sometimes when they're trying to figure out, uh, it, it might be a smaller client, they want to really keep expenses down and uh, they will sometimes ask for recommendations. And some of the questions that we would get in projects we may ask to work on are compiling legislative and regulatory histories for specific language or for an entire act or a section, finding language in SEC documents and locating court filings by or against specific individuals, locating um, specific types of forms or clauses used in those forms, finding census data, it, obtaining lists of top taxpayers in a city or county, and compiling information um, about and written by experts or testimony of experts, and find out who's representing a potential client in court. Those are, are some of the, it, the list goes on. They, they can ask um, any type of question and we provide an answer. Um, not all research is client related. Uh, we also, or, or billable, um, uh, some re we research some things such as uh, how are other law firms using the iPad uh, in their practices, uh, questions about vendors who can monitor trademarks internationally, um, and also how successful are alternative billing arrangements in other firms. And we have two questions. Do you think we should finish and then do the oh, questions? Sure. So, okay. Well, there were two questions, and we, we have a few more slides. So we'll, um, one question is the AALL survey says that libraries with from 91 to 150 attorneys spend at the following levels mean 9,700 or median 6,894. How does your law firm compare? Or is that private information? Um, you know, our law firm, um, it, it, the rate, I haven't checked recently, but because we have such a, a large practice, many practice areas, we see that our costs are on the higher side, but we, um, but we work with this all the time. It's something that we keep in mind. We look at our collection and see what can we do to trim back here or there. But because we have um, so many practice areas and we want to have the basic materials for the, for the attorneys to use, our costs are in the, um, I'm going to say in the median area. But hopefully less because that's what we've been trying <laughs> to work on. But I haven't checked, um, I didn't check for this program what it is right now. And did you want to answer that? I'd have question? to. I'd have to say the same. Uh, we might be a, a little less. Uh, I think because it's. I think because it's a newer firm, like certain things, we've gotten things as we've needed them. There aren't a lot of things that we've carried, you know, over a really long period of time. So we might be a little towards the lower end of that and. I have, and I had another comment too. The the data that gets collected here might include things that we do not include if we were report when we report this. So that's there's such variation as to what people will uh, count as a legal research um, title. It could be their whole electronic budget. It may not include their electronic budget. So those are just things to keep in mind. But this is just one um, source of the data. There are other law firm management companies that also um, report this out to our, our management and our exec executive committee. And do, do you have a question? Um, since you mentioned that your law firm is relatively new, could you start with a standard set of Or collection for law libraries? 
there, there was a core collection because the firm sort of originated uh, with a group of attorneys that were in pretty much one practice group. It was a lot of estate planning, business succession, um, of that area. And as it's kind of as business grew, as the firm grew, and uh, we acquired more and more. They, they started with some of the basic print materials. Um, and then at, at one point, um, like say our litigation department, uh, business really increased. We, uh, so those materials increased. And, and then we added uh, an environmental, uh, a few environmental attorneys. And, and so it really, it, it grew with the need, with client need. So, um, and the American Bar Association, you know, when they accredit um, law school libraries, they have certain requirements that those libraries need to contain certain materials. Well, back when our law firm started, those were all very affordable. But our collection has changed greatly, so we do not like maintain um, a lot of things that were there, you know, before. That's so. The, and there's also a book that I keep on the shelf called Recommended Law Books. It's interesting to to see that. But it, there's a lot of digests and the case law from all the different states that were required, and the statutes of all different states were required to be in an academic law library. And so um, many law firm libraries would re, would have reflected that, but that's not the case any longer. Another question is, I sense you guys have to dress better than in many other types of libraries. Do you receive clothing allowances? I've asked for them, but no. <laughs> Either that or a comfortable uniform that we they just wear. Say, they say you can wear the same thing every day. They don't <laughs> care. They don't care. But, <laughs> but no. no, but it's a professional law firm environment. We have very, very few casual days. Those are tied to fundraising days, like for the American Heart Association or for cancer um, uh, contributions. So, um, but thank you for saying that we look nice today. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> All right. All right. So, do you like part time, full time? Yes. How does that work with your health insurance? I mean, law firms must be very good at giving you sick time. Sick time, uh, time. There, I'd say it's pretty standard with any uh, with any business. You know, uh, the. I'm, I'm sorry, the, how did you phrase the question again as, as far as um, your benefit packages? Benefit, benefit packages, uh, well, part, I, I was originally full-time and, um, and had a temporary job share and then uh, we did not replace the other person. Um, so that's how I became part-time. But so our firm is pretty good uh, in regards to part-time. If you're there a certain amount of time, you, you can have PTO. Um, but I, you might be, I, I think insurance packages are the same, getting worse for everybody. <laughs> <laughs> No, my, I, I'm part-time as a job share, but I have benefits at the firm, but um, insurance wasn't one I wanted because I have insurance from another source. So, that's how it, and then yeah. I was going to say, uh, did we do the networking slide? No. No. Okay. We we're going to do that because we're, we're time's up. Oh, we time. okay. Two more slides. Um, because we can't own everything and materials are so expensive, uh, we often need to borrow materials from other libraries. Uh, this work is shared by both the librarian and the paraprofessional um, and our professional contacts uh, that we develop through the various organizations help us get these materials in a timely way. As law librarians, professional associations like NLA, um, AALL, the American Association of Law Libraries, uh, Special Libraries Association, which is known as SLA, and especially SLA Nebraska, our local chapter, gives us the opportunity to to meet other librarians, especially law librarians in Omaha and Nebraska. 
And we support each other by providing information via a listserv or a telephone call to other librarians in these organizations. SLA Nebraska has also helped us develop leadership skills as um, officers, past and present, planning and leading meetings, and participating in programs at the national level. If you're a student, and the ML MLS student will pay for your SLA membership right now and and you could just complete a form that we have and hand, we, you can just hand it to us or mail it to Maureen she's our treasurer um, and we do you know if uh, if you are interested in becoming a member um, and you're not a student uh, we you know and if you're really interested We'll see what we can do in our budget for anything. <laughs> um, We'd like you to join and maybe attend a few of our meetings. We're meeting every other month. Sometimes we've, we've come to Lincoln a few times to meet with um, people that are members in this community. And it, because our, our field is so specialized, um, you know, and, and commercial, because it's not a academic or, or state funded, it's it's kind of uh, been a good resource for us. So, well, thank you for this opportunity to speak to you today, and please contact us if you have any questions now or later. Thank you, Maureen. Thank you, Mary. Uh, we're going to take a break till noon, and we'll be back.
Welcome back. Our next presenters are going to be presenting from the Omaha Eastern Library Service um, Office. It's Nancy Schmiel of Omaha Public Library and Deb Venipal of the Omaha Public School of Omaha Public School Librarian. The Doublement of Libraries. Unmute. What? That won't let me go smaller. Um, the red, the red thing. This? Yeah. There you go. Okay. <laughs> Can we? All right. You can go ahead. Oh, and here's the microphone. Here's the mic. Yeah. Oh. Um, we're hoping everybody can hear us. Do you? Do you need me to open up a something so you can see? Here in Lincoln, we can see both Amen. the presenters and we can hear you. We might want to touch just a touch louder, okay? A touch louder? That was awesome. That was awesome. Okay. Are you guys, you're probably not seeing us. We can't figure out how to get us in front. We can see you in Lincoln. Right here. All right, how's that working for everybody? Deb and I will try to make sure that we pass the mic back and forth. Um, I'm Nancy Schmiel, and I am the children's librarian at um, Saddlebrook Library, the public side of um, the building. And this is, I am Deb Benepal. I am the school librarian at Saddlebrook Elementary, and Nancy and I work together frequently. So what we're going to do today is, oh, and this PowerPoint will be available to you online. We didn't get handouts done in time, so you'll have this PowerPoint. It might not be as flashy as you would like, but this is what you get. <laughs> <laughs> and, oh, technology is fun for librarians. So what we're going to talk about today is, um, first we're going to tell you about the facility. This is called the Double Men of Libraries because the library is both the school library and the public library, but we actually are an entity that is three things in one. Our building houses an elementary school, a public library, and a community center. So we're going to tell you a little bit about that. Um, we're going to tell you how we work together as librarians um, because we both are, have full-time jobs doing what I do as a public librarian and Deb as the school librarian. And then we talked about um, how you can get your foot in the door of schools. We're going to talk about schools because it's what we do. But anything we talk about getting your foot in the door is getting your foot in the door anywhere. If what you want to do is take your services from your library to someone else, things that you can use to do that. So first, Deb, is there anything you'd like to say about our location? It's in northwest Omaha, um, very convenient, uh, conveniently located, and it's a good location for um, uh, that particular area because uh, there hasn't been a lot of public library influence in that area for forever and uh, so it's I think it's well utilized a little bit tricky to find if yep. you don't know where you're going but uh, anyway it's a very nice place so what we're going to do is I'm going to show you a video I can tell you that your video the, the visual may not be very clear and um, I'm hoping that the audio comes through. We'll hold the microphone as close to our computer as possible so that you can get the audio. When you get this PowerPoint, you can go. It's the video on the Omaha Public, or Omaha Public Schools, Saddlebrook Elementary School. It's on their web page. They're the ones that constructed it. But this will just give you a good idea of what our <coughs> facility is. You can see pictures here now. That's um, the commons area on the left and right over here. And then this is our rotating bookshelf in the library. This is the community center. And then this is the library. So we're going to go to, hopefully, the video. Okay. Keep your fingers crossed. But in terms of community, when you walk in the building, take a look around the Saddlebrook Joint Use Facility in Northwest Omaha and you'll see a center dedicated to lifelong learning, health, and wellness. 
Saddlebrook is the first building in the United States to house an elementary school, public library, and recreation center under the same roof, which provides exceptional convenience for visitors of all ages. Mm -hmm. It's definitely a one stop shop where we can do everything in one place. Yeah, it's playing. The problem is it's the loading. Yeah, and everybody knows the other. Huh. Planning and building the Saddlebrook Joint Use Facility. You get to listen to it because our wireless is fast enough for you to get to the sessions and provided suggestions that influence the architect's final design. The Omaha Public Schools, the Omaha Public Library, and City of Omaha Parks and Recreation mm -hmm. Department fully committed to a unified project vision. And that cooperation resulted in an inviting, secure, and environmentally friendly space that serves the entire community. Yeah, my mom, my brother, and I come here uh, every day after school to check out books from the library. And almost every weekend, we can go to the community center and play games. The building is strategically arranged to optimize shared usage. A centrally located commons can be flexibly used as a lobby, assembly space, or exhibit area. The stage can open to the gym or commons, and a community room, cafeteria, and art room are available for public use. The public library and schools share books and resources. The rotating bookshelf provides a barrier during the school day to keep student safety a priority. The school uses the library for classroom lessons and computer use, and teachers can conveniently check out materials for their classrooms. While school is in session, the gymnasium is divided half for PE classes, half for rec center visitors. The recreation center often supports teachers with games and activities and offers students, their families, and the entire community a wide range of fitness classes and recreational opportunities. Sandbrook is so cool because I can learn and be at the library and the rec center at the same time. The Saddlebrook partners made every effort to implement effective security measures, including electronic ID badges for staff, nearly 50 security cameras, limited access points, and security personnel. Modern technologies are visible throughout the entire Saddlebrook Joint Use Facility. An extensive green roof covers 25% of the building and helps with temperature control year-round. Members of the school's green team help maintain the roof and compare its effectiveness to the traditional roof by monitoring data provided by advanced climate sensors. Impressive computer labs are available to students and library visitors. An in-house TV studio provides an opportunity for creative instruction and allows students to produce learning announcements. And high-tech teaching tools like interactive printing boards and animal visual presenters are used in each classroom. The Saddlebrook Joint Use Facility is more than a building. It's a model of cooperation. It's a center of learning and wellness for all ages. And it's a valuable resource there is oh. <laughs> it's okay. <laughs> you can bring it back. <laughs> we won't make you watch it again. Um, you can do it on your own time. Now, there we go. So that's the entire building. Um, as we talked about, we are just one part. The library is one piece of that building. Um, and we share it between the two of us. The one thing we missed them seeing, I think, was the rotating bookshelf. Um, oh, they saw it. They saw it. They saw it. So you got to see the bookshelf. So what we're going to talk about now is a little bit about how we work as librarians together for the school. So we're not going to spend any time right now on what we do with the community center because we have projects with them as well, but just um, between librarians. And there we go. So one thing that we share is our collection, and I'm going to let Deb get started on things about the collection. Okay, there are many benefits um, that the Saddlebrook Elementary uh, gets from being a part of Omaha Public Library's collection, and one of the main things is that we have a larger, students have a larger availability to a number of items that possibly my budget wouldn't be able to accommodate otherwise. And for some examples, that might be uh, lower level readers, um, such as your beginning, uh, beginning readers and early readers. I may not, in a school setting, be able to order quite as many as are available 
at the school, at the library rather, as well as they are in a, a little niche area where students can go to them and find them rather quickly and easily. Uh, larger, uh, another uh, way is that students who are above level readers uh, may be able to find more materials that are on a fifth grade, sixth grade, or even beyond level um, than I would be able to house in a school library. Uh, teachers benefit because they can use the online um, catalog and get uh, materials online and then pick them up right at their school. They're delivered right, right to their location. Um, so that's also a benefit. Um, holiday books, um, superhero books, um, Where's Waldo books, all of those novelty type items that I possibly wouldn't be able to furnish students on such a great level are available to them. And uh, teachers have um, much more um, access to the classroom card use that OPL offers, and that's offered to all teachers, however, they um, anywhere in the city. However, I think our teachers have a better availability to use them, that particular feature of yours. Yeah, I would, I would agree with that. Um, every teacher at Saddlebrook Elementary School has a classroom card, and what those are for people that don't know, um, if your principal says it's okay and they give us a letter, um, Deb Barilos, who's here, or was here, she's still here, uh, our, our circulation manager, she approves them, they get a classroom card, and for Saddlebrook Elementary, it is a K through four, soon to be K through five school, so they do juvenile materials, and so they get a card that they can use to check out materials for their classroom, and by the principal saying, it's okay for you to have this card, it doesn't go on their personal card, so if books get lost, if books get damaged, um, somebody else is responsible than having it on your personal card, because that's a lot of responsibility for a teacher to take for their students. And so every teacher in our class, the art teacher, the music teacher, everybody has that, has a card. Um, last year, one of the classrooms was doing research on Omaha. Well, Deb wouldn't be able to afford all of the materials that the Omaha Public Library has on the city of Omaha. So we were able to bring in a multitude of materials for them um, that the students got to use to do their projects that they were having, so that was great. For us as a public library, the great thing about having a teacher um, and having her be able to order things that are, have to do with the curriculum, we don't have to spend our money filling that need. She can spend her money filling that need, and then we have more money to spend on things like um, media, because the school doesn't buy media, so we have more money at Saddlebrook to spend on things like music CDs and books on CD and the new playaways that are out. Um, we, can, we can shift how we spend our money over to there. Um, so that's been a really great uh, asset to us. She can order certain periodicals, we get other periodicals. Um, um, we had a collection development person come into our library just recently and she actually said the depth of what you have here is better than um, almost anywhere she's seen because we have both of us working on it. So that's our collection. Anything else on the collection? The only thing I was going to mention, too, was that um, the book sets that teachers can use for level reading groups within their classroom are much easier to achieve because they can draw from the whole city library and bring them in. And that's very helpful to them in their instruction. Mm -hmm. So that's our collection, one of the ways that we do stuff together. Um, the next thing is doing programs together and partnering. Um, our ultimate goal at all times is to get kids excited about reading. We know K through four kids as our readers do better in school. They get higher um, achievement marks, and everybody knows that in this day and age of education, we want those high marks in the uh, state tests and the national tests and that type of stuff. And um, reading helps them <laughs> helps them achieve that. So some of the things that we're able to do together, um, I literally can walk across the hall and be in a classroom. Um, a teacher can say, hey, we're having, um, we need a mystery reader. Would you like to be our mystery reader? And it takes, you know, I'm only going to be in there for 15 minutes to 20 minutes, and it only takes me a total of 20 minutes to do that. I don't have to drive across town or um, do that type of stuff. So the kids get to see me um, in the public library setting, and they get to see me in their school, which is something all librarians want to have. You want the kids to make a connection between school and you. You don't want them to think teachers only live in the school and sleep in the school. They have an outside life. You know, it's making that connection, um, and I can do that very, very easily. Um, PTA meetings are held in the library, so I literally walk across, 
you know, the library to be, attend a PTA meeting. Those PTA moms and dads um, know what we have to offer. Um, and so access is a, an immense benefit that we have for those kids. Um, and then there's just some other programs that we do together. Okay, one of them is Lunch Bunch, and we started doing that this year. Um, that's basically a program where Nancy wanted to create some kind of a little group that we could work together on, not necessarily within the classroom, but outside the classroom. And I wanted to promote the intermediate Golden Sower nominees a little bit more, and so what we decided to do was create Lunch Bunch. And that is uh, for, because we only have fourth grade at our school right now, it's for fourth grade students. And they bring about 20 students out of both classes, uh, bring their lunch to the commons area that you saw in the, <coughs> excuse me, in the video. <coughs> and um, they eat their lunch while Nancy and I read aloud. We read excerpts from the Golden Sower nominees such as masterpiece, masterpiece novels, <laughs> and we, uh, we try to get them excited about not only listening during Lunch Bunch, but continuing to read the book above and beyond what we can cover it through the Lunch Bunch area. Um, it has increased their exposure. It has increased their interest. Um, I'm, I'm pretty sure that we have a higher number of Golden Sower voters in the intermediate level, and that's worked out really well. Um, and it's just a good excuse to do a read aloud, which is fun. It was very fun. We actually had one of the students, um, we were only going to do it through March because voting for Golden Sower is in April, and the kids were like, why aren't we doing Lunch Bunch anymore? And we're like, well, okay, so we're going to do it in April and May. They won't be Golden Sowers, we'll pick a different book. Um, the kids get to come. I, you know, it's, I don't know about you, but when I was in school, what I remember are field trips, people that came to visit the classroom, um, anything that's a little outside the norm. So for them to get to bring their lunch and leave the group, they, they line up to sign up. And so it's been great. And also it's a good PR tool because while Nancy and I are in the Commons area reading, many patrons to the library as well as users of the community center pass by and they smile. They're paying attention to what we're doing with students and, and you can tell they're appreciating our efforts. It's been really fun. Um, summer reading program, for those of you that have any knowledge of summer reading program at your location, whether you're a school or whether you're a public library participant, like whether you work at a public library or whether you go to a public library, you probably see lots and lots of kids over the summer at your public library. Um, for us, for me as a children's librarian, <coughs> the hard part is getting the kids to know about it. Um, the benefit, again, at Saddlebrook, we're, I'm right there. So Debbie lets me have um, one classroom period for every single classroom that comes in. I go talk to them about summer reading program. Every year I do a challenge where I used to work with teenagers and they picked interesting things like dressing me goth <laughs> or riding a bull. It was a mechanical bull, but riding a bull if they read enough books. It's some challenge that if they read enough books, I'll do something. Saddlebrook Elementary kids got to be my voters this year, this past year, and they came up with 96 ideas having to do with um, make a splash at your library from swimming with sharks at the zoo, which they said I couldn't do, um, to jumping off a roof into a vat of electric eels, to um, what ended up being my challenge, which was I slept on the roof and we had a water fight. They did not know that we have a green roof and there's a hose on the roof. So I won the water fight. But um, <laughs> they, they, they had a blast. Kids like to get wet. But the school then, all the students, we put up a poster in the school. I had a whole wall to display past challenges. Um, to put up ideas that the kids have come up with. And then when I went and talked to their classrooms, I had little coffee cans and everybody got a poker chip. And I, I dwindled it down to four. I did not let them choose between 96 options. But dwindled it down to four, told them about the summer reading, told them about if they read 20,000 books, I would do what they voted for. Um, they got to vote for it. They saw the results of their voting. And then they got to participate in the water fight and... Um, they read so many books that not only do we have, I stayed on the roof and had a water fight, but then I came down and we had a water balloon fight after that. So they were very, very involved. And Saddlebrook, of the nine schools that I am responsible for getting the information out to, Saddlebrook had the highest number of participants and the highest number of kids that made it through level one of any elementary school. 
it's due to exposure. They got that exposure. And then our classrooms, we have summer school at Saddlebrook. And we do large programs. A lot of libraries do over the summer. You can see um, to the right, there's a teacher they're actually holding a huge snake is what they're holding. We had the reptiles come and uh, we also had that we had Mad Science Iowa come um, and in that common space that you've seen the summer school kids got to come during summer school to the programs that we were able to offer and afford for the library. And Mr. Zook, who's the gentleman there, um, anecdotally said uh, Saddlebrook had the highest amount of retention for summer school. 92% of the kids that started summer school finished summer school. And that's the highest, he, as, from what he knew, for Omaha public, or Omaha public Schools, elementary schools. He attributes it to the fact that we had fun, fun programs for them to participate in, and that was because of the library being there. Okay, what I'm going to talk to you about is L with the librarians that you see there. Um, sometimes we call it Ling with the librarians, and the L comes from the picture right next to the picture of Mr. Zook and, and the students and other teachers there. Um, licorice is one of the L's that we use. We've used uh, lollipops, we've used lemon drops, we've used lemonade, we've used... We've not yet used lasagna. Not yet. <laughs> not yet. No <laughs> lasagna yet. Um, but what this is, is partly a, um, a behavior incentive in the library and partly a reading incentive in the newsletter. And students um, submit tickets to um, a drawing pot and then we draw their names. And those students um, that are drawn each time a newsletter comes out, they get to tour the library from behind the scenes so they can see where the books come in, what happens to them, uh, how they're processed, that sort of thing. And then we show them our offices and try to get them to guess which one's mine's the, the cleanest. Mess, mine's the messiest desk. <laughs> they, they get it right most of the time. Um, and then we serve them, uh, Omaha Public Libraries uh, serves them, or, yeah, supports or benefits or, or I gives buy. Them, she buys <laughs> the licorice, the um, the lollipops, whatever the L word happens to be, whatever the L food happens to be. And so we share conversation, we share laughter. It's a, um, a good way to build relationships with the students in a different way, in a more relaxed way. Yeah. And for me, I mean, Deb has to know all their names because she sees them. She learned that. I, I don't have a classroom setting where I get to know all the kids' names. And so it's one way for me to have... <laughs> Uh, she says she tries to learn all the names. <laughs> um, so that gives me also another opportunity to, to get on a name basis because kids do, whether it's children, teens, or adults, people respond to somebody who knows who they are. They respond if you can say, hi, Martha, how are you? Hi, Debbie, how are you? Um, it makes them, it, it just makes them feel more comfortable around you and it makes them feel more valued. And so all the opportunities that we get to do that, we try to take. Um, oh, you have a next one. Omaha Kids Read. Omaha does a um, yearly, mostly. Um, we pick a book, uh, one for kids to read all together as a city, and then one for the adults to read all together. And this year it was The Secret Garden by Frances Hodgson Burnett. I think I got that all right. Um, so, so we advertised it, and then Debbie took it one step further, and she actually put it into her curriculum, and I'm going to let her tell you about that. So what, if you look at the picture, the long uh, picture at the bottom of the screen there in the bottom right-hand corner, um, what I did was found a picture book version of, of um, The Secret Garden, and I read it in the computer lab to every class. And then we, we talked about how, uh, what a story map is. Um, we talked about the, we, in a story map, we discussed the characters, the setting, the problem, and the solution to the problem within the story. And I assigned each grade level, a, beginning with first grade, a certain section of that story map. So um, the first grade students um, typed in who they thought the characters were. The second grade students did the setting. The third grade students um, talked about the problems in their part, and then the fourth grade students did the solution to the problems. And, and it just became an all-school story map for the Omaha Kids Read this year. And it was the nice thing, you see it displayed there. Well, that's displayed in the space that is both the public and the private library, or public and the school library. So not only did the kids get to see their stuff, they could bring their parents in. Kids from other schools, you know, because we get all the surrounding schools come to our public library, they got to see what the kids at 
Saddlebrook Elementary did. It's up there for them to see. So um, even that has helped. Our, our Zia, the Labradoodle, that's something that's on the horizon. Um, kids love to read to dogs. It, um, it gives them somewhere to practice what they do in a very non-threatening way with someone who is um, fully accepting of them tripping over words. and um, it's, it's a great thing. So we have, we have found um, a woman, Stephanie Jansen, who has a Labradoodle. And so in the evening, um, two evenings a month, she's going to bring Zia to the library. And we'll have anybody that's affiliated with the public library, which can be students from Saddlebrook or students from other surrounding schools, they can sign up for a time to read with Zia. We're also going to find a time during the school day when Zia will come. And Mrs. Venipaw can use um, Zia and the teachers can use Zia in ways that will help encourage the students in their uh, reading as well. So it's it, the one program isn't necessarily joint, but because we have access to presenters, we're able to utilize them both in the school setting and in the library. Mm -hmm. And everything that the kids see in the school that they also see in the library just makes that connection all the stronger that um, your life is all related. Um, what you do at school, you can do at the library. What you do at the library, you can go, you know, we've got the community center there. Um, we just try to make those connections for kids. Now on to wanting to get outside of your library um, and to let people know what it is that you do. How do you get your foot in the door? These are things that we've come up with and we're going to leave lots and lots of time for you guys to share um, what you've come up with or to ask us questions about anything. Um, I'm going to let Deb talk about the first one. The first thing that you should probably do is make contact with the um, school librarian and make sure that he or she understands that you want to supplement whatever it is, is that is going on in the, in the school library. Um, just to be sure that nobody feels like their toes are getting stepped on. And um, you're going to find that some are going to be very open and some are are not, and it's just going, but that would be your first place to start, I would recommend. Um, and as I have just found out recently, somebody's past experience can really hinder your current experience. <laughs> if they have had a bad experience, um, they might not be as open to you coming, so you might need to work around that a little bit. Um, and you may have no idea why it's not going well with whoever you're contacting. And we're talking specifically about schools, but if what you want to do is you want to get into a business, because you want to tell them what kind of offerings you can help them with, like the databases that you have available. Um, one of the things you need to know is you need to know what you have to offer. You know that you're great and everybody should like libraries. I have found that just saying libraries are great doesn't work. Um, because they don't know what you have to offer them, they might say, well, they're just for checking out books. Or they're, um, I don't use the library because I go to Borders. Um, I have the internet. Everything's on the internet. No one's ever heard that before. Um, so, so you need to have, in a sense, you need to have something to sell and you need to know how to sell it. So if you're a public librarian going in, you can talk about summer reading program. And the fact that the summer re having kids read over the summer um, has been proven to help them retain what they learned in the spring through what they learned in the fall so that there's not as much repeat going on for the teachers. And it makes their job easier. Anything you can do to tell them it makes their job easier. Um, if what you know is... Um, you can help them with research because you do have databases that you're paying a lot of money for or that the commission is paying a lot of money for you to have access to. Teach them how to get there. You can show them how to get there. Um, teach them how to use your online catalog so they can get the materials that they need. But have something specific to offer them, not just libraries are great and we can come and tell you how great we are. It probably won't cut it. Um, if your first contact doesn't happen, if, if um, you know, you always want to find the, the one person that you can start that relationship. I think you said it really well earlier today. What was your thing about one person? You might know of a teacher at a certain school, and, and you know that that teacher is open and practices in, within her, his or her classroom, that um, they're open to more um, uh, off-the-wall type instruction. And so they might be more interested in having you come in and, and assist them. Um, team teach, team teach whatever you know, whatever you are uh, attempting to do with them. Um, I would begin with with a teacher, and the if you can start with one teacher, even though it's just one teacher, and start small. Believe me, the word will get around, and 
pretty soon you'll have more than one teacher and, and more and more as the years go by. So, yeah, start, start with the one really good connection and then it will grow from there. Don't, you don't need to uh, hit everybody at once. Um, other ideas, <laughs> pardon me, like for schools, I go to PTA meetings. Um, if, if you have a library patron who you know is a room mother or a room father, they have parties all year long. Um, put a be in their bonnet about you could come and do a story time at their classroom party for Valentine's Day. Um, get in in creative ways and get in small, have it be a positive experience and then like you said that will grow. Um, if you know the principal, see if you can come and talk at a staff meeting about how to get classroom cards for us. Like we could go tell them how, to, how they can get classroom cards and how great that is. Talk to the principal because he, he or she has to give permission first so let, you know, let them know. Um, one of the big things, and there's some other options over there, teachers, room parents, um, is there a preschool affiliated? You could do stuff with that. We had last year, it was really, it was pretty fun for me. <laughs> we have a um, early childhood special ed class and Mrs. Venipal, God bless her, last year had to open a brand new school. This is only our second, second full school year. She had to open a brand new school. Because we are a joint library, the um, catalog that she was used to for all the years working for Omaha Public Schools changed because she had to learn Omaha Public Library's catalog. Um, so she was opening a brand new school. She was learning an entirely new system of how to do things. Um, everything was new. And so we, they had early childhood. And I said, I'll do early childhood. So twice a month, that early childhood class came around to the public side and I did story time for them. So invite people in. Invite them to do Possibly invite them to come and have um, a field trip to the library um, where you'll provide something for them that's possible. Do your homework. Um, know if you're working with a school, what are the curriculum requirements for your district, for the schools that you want to get into. Um, try to anticipate what their needs are and provide it for them before they know. Um, that always impresses people like, wow, you have that and you knew that the fourth grade was studying vectors. so you put out a display at your public library on um, vectors and creative paper mache things you can make with vectors, uh, you know, whatever it is. Find out what they're um, studying or what they're interested in. Um, the more you get to know individual students, um, <laughs> the better. And Deb can certainly talk to this next one. Make it easy. <laughs> definitely. <laughs> Go ahead. Oh. Um, Definitely, I would try to make it easy for whatever teacher you are um, pinpointing as um, beginning this relationship with and, and this program with. Um, try to make the teacher feel like there is very little that he or she needs to plan for or prepare for. And um, I think you'll have a lot better time uh, convincing them to work with you. That's true. Um, other ways to make it easy from a public library standpoint, if you're going to show them how to use the databases and library cards are necessary for them to access them, have library cards with you that they can use to access it. Um, take applications to them, let them complete them, and deliver application or deliver completed cards back to them. Um, at, at times, you might find out what will make it easier for you to get into another location. It might be a little bit harder on your own institution, and so work within your institution. Um, to kind of to help solve those problems, um, to start those conversations. Um, we are very fortunate at Omaha Public Library that, you know, I, I, Deb Barilos is right behind me. Um, you know, they make that very easy. I can go into a school. I can take, they've worked out that they will look at addresses for me so the address check is done and that the parents have approved and we can take classroom cards back to them. So things that you do to make it um, a smooth, simple, easy process um, we'll guarantee that you get asked back, and we'll guarantee that you get asked by more people to be there. Um, that's one thing. And last but not least, don't get discouraged if the first time it doesn't go right. <laughs> um, just keep trying. Um, if one location doesn't work, let them go for a while and then and try it somewhere else. Um, learn, from, learn from how it went uh, and continue on from there. So... Now comes the easy part, for me anyway. If anybody has questions, if you guys have ideas, um, we're going to see how all this sound works, and I promise we'll repeat questions from here for those of you out there. <laughs> and we're hoping they have them. Hmm. 
we thought discussion would be nice and big and great. And, <laughs> and are you all just ready for lunch? Well, I have a question in, in, okay, I'm getting feedback. I have a question in Lincoln. All right. When doing the pros and cons of co-locating public and school library, one of the cons is how to handle the presence of adult level materials fiction, nonfiction, and online. How do folks handle this when your sample population is K to four, soon to be K to five? Deb, you want to take that one? Okay. Um, basically, we separate the uh, adult materials from the uh, children's section by the, I call the lazy Susan bookshelf, but um, it's a rotating bookshelf that stays closed during the school day and locked and nobody can get through although we have had a few toddlers can toddlers get through, get through. <laughs> 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 but um, basically that's how we separate that and I've had students ask me if they can go next door and and pick up um, a video or something and I don't encourage that because it's it's just um, would put them into the public library scene and it's just not something, it's a place where I want them to be during school time. But um, it's worked out just fine. My instruction area is not really an eyesight of anywhere in the public, public side. So um, it's, it's worked out quite well that way. Um, there is every so once in a while an issue of um, appropriateness for a school child and it's it's more my personal uh, preference of you know what is a parent going to think if I or say if I let the student check out this particular book and that comes up not very often at all but I just tell them that they'll have to come back after school and um, with their parents and check it out then. Yeah we have it we haven't had too much difficulty and part of it is also educating the, the parents of the students that one of the benefits they get is that their child has access to so much more than they would get being in another school and so um, Deb can say they only get two books during library time. They can check out two books and so she can say look during your library time here this is what I'm limited to letting you check out and then the kids can come after school and they can check out what they want to check out. The rotating bookshelf does do that. Only children's materials are available on the school side during the school day. Come on, you guys, it's not lunch time yet. <laughs> what about online the adult materials during the day? Students are not, um, they don't have the computer, they only have computer access to catalogs. Um, on when they're in the library and then if they're in the computer lab oh. with Debbie then um, they have all of the same they're on the OPS they're on the OPS network in our computer lab and so there are so many filters on the OPS network that there's no way they can get to anything inappropriate and if they do I can have it blocked in a matter of you know seconds <laughs> so it's it's not that's not an issue really right now. <coughs> um, a question here in, in uh, Omaha has been, are there any cons at all in working in the same building? Um, we intentionally did not put those in our presentation because we thought they'd probably come up and you guys would ask us. Um, I don't know. I'll let you start. <laughs> This, is, this isn't really a con, it's just that it, it takes a lot more time to do ordering for me because there's another person, a very good person, that is ordering wonderful materials. It's not me. <laughs> Somebody else. <laughs> and I may find a fabulous book that I'd like to order and Joanne 
is has already ordered it and that's not a bad thing that's that's it's already a part of our collection so that makes it more time consuming um, I don't know um, of any other cons with ordering than that um, and as far as the school setting goes there's there are no cons no. I, there are none that I can think of at all we we have been extremely fortunate um, in that the Omaha Public Library, Omaha Public Schools, and um, Omaha Park and Rec, they chose people at this point who are um, overseeing these three entities who are very much into collaboration. And so it has been very fluid. Um, if I need to use the gym for something and it's available, the community center is very helpful. If the school has been extraordinarily um, gracious for the community center because Everybody knows budgets have been tight. They started building our building when gas prices went up, and so the building is smaller than it needs to be for where we are. Um, the community center has tons of classes they need to have, so the school has allowed them to use classrooms for certain things. It's been great. Um, I would say one of the only glitches we've had is the fact that the entire children's section is not available during the school day. Homeschooling has somewhat been an issue, that if homeschoolers come, um, and they're and they're not uh, really young. Like if they're fourth, fifth, and sixth graders, they don't have free reign to go wander the shelves. Um, we can take them over there. <laughs> so it's just one more educational piece, and we're going to work on that a little bit more next year. You know, possibly looking at Debbie's schedule. When are the kids in the computer lab so that I could be over on the, that side and we could actually take a homeschool family. We could have homeschool research day, and the homeschoolers could come. But I would say that's been it. Or when toddlers squeeze through right here right there. When the toddlers <laughs> squeeze through, we have to go over and get them. Um, that's kind of an it. <laughs> On your green ropes, plant, basically. Hmm. Um, the question is, what do we plant on the green <laughs> Pardon me. On the green roof? Um, we don't plant it, so that's yeah. the good thing. We're not responsible for that. They have planted lots and lots of um, sedum types of plants that retain moisture and um, don't need a lot of moisture or are drought resistant, and so they take the rainwater and they grow from there. Um, as you saw in the video, I don't think I have any pictures here. You all are going to have to go back and watch the video because you missed part of it. But um, in the community center and in the, um, the library, we have a computer that shows you the difference between how the roof is heating and cooling on the Convention. conventional side and on the green roof side. Um, and so, um, and, and in the video, and I might have blocked it out, I might have walked right in front of the camera, um, it does show you some of the plants that they've planted up there. And the kids weeding, I think it showed you the kids weeding. Um, and there's actually a lot of weeds up there. I think they forgot that the winds blow and seeds land on roofs. But um, it is a lot, it's a lot of, it's drought resistant. It's, um, and it, there is no watering system up there. It's rainwater supposed to cut it. Um, so. We'll see. And it is amazing to look. <laughs> they take a temperature at, um, at three different levels of the roof. So like right where it meets the building, in the middle, and then um, what it is on the surface. And there can be dramatic temperature differences, especially on a conventional roof. It'll be really hot and really cold, and you'll get more, um, a, a more mediated or closer temperature differential on the, the green roof side. Who's the plants the support for some of Janitors and gardens and stuff like is that a city responsibility or a school district responsibility? I just wondering, you know, mm -hmm. uh, financially, how they interact. The the question is um, here in Omaha. Um, financially, who who does what? Um, who provides like janitorial service? Who provides you know gardening care? Who provides um, staffing for things? Um, and we actually have, if, we, if I say something wrong, our, our uh, facilities person is here, so we know. Um, I believe the school own, the Omaha Public Schools own the building. Is that correct? Okay, so we're, if we get this wrong, I mean, it pretty much the school actually is, the, the school system is responsible for the, is responsible for the physical building. So their janitor, their custodians um, take care of cleaning. Um, they take care of security. They take care of snow removal. They take care of um, icing. Um, they do all of that. Um, <laughs> so anything structural, 
to the building. If a window breaks, it's them. If um, the roof leaks, it's the school. If the air conditioning doesn't work, it's the school. They Even provide if it's that. on the library side. Even if it's on the library side, yes. Even if it's on the library side, they um, are responsible for the make the care and maintenance of the building. And then they charge them for the library their share. And then we pay for it. <laughs> we, pay we pay for um, our we pay for our share. So so the public library is so big of a percentage of the entire space of the building. So I'm going to make up a number. 20% of the entire space is that. So we would pay for 20% of the the custodial services of that bill. Um, it's kind of like if you have an apartment building and you have your own meter, um, you pay for your part of the meter. Does that answer your question? Mm -hmm. Okay. Enough? I've got a question about adult programming. Can you share a little bit about how you handle your adult programming? Um, is, I know you do a little bit about it. Mm -hmm. you, you know, is that <laughs> successful or is it, uh, is it more just kids? Okay. Um, uh, we have a question here about adult programming at um, the library and on site. Um, <coughs> and we do have adult programming as well. There, there are um, people that are not just families with small children. Um, those do tend to be, from a public library perspective, they are the largest number. We get the largest numbers for those because we're so visible to families. They're coming in and out of our doors every single day. So when we have Santa Claus, we have 300 people. Um, when we do something weirdly, Halloween is much more, um, I, I don't know, popular. We had 500 people for that. But we have had adult programming. Um, we have book clubs. We have three successful book clubs going right now. We have a Get Crafty, um, a joint program that's actually going to be between the school and the community center and the library, sort of joint. Um, the school is having a, um, they're going to have a craft fair, and it's going to be a mom's night out. Um, so they'll have, a, um, they're providing all the crafts, but like we'll have a table and our adult services librarian will be over there and she's doing green um, body care and green um, health care where you make your own, you know, baking soda and vinegar do lots of great things. So she's going to show them that. She'll have that available to them. So, so also even the parents will know we do stuff for them, not just for children. So it's the exposure out. We, we what can't have, because we are on school property, um, some of you may have heard about like our board silly or our, um, the, uh, what's the dating one? We have speed dating. Um, the speed dating events, <clears throat> those, we are able to get liquor licenses to hold some of those adult events at other libraries. We cannot do that because we are on school grounds. And so liquor licenses will not be had for, for us, for any adult programming that we have there. Is this the first year you've had your reading to the dogs? Your lab reading? <laughs> Actually, <laughs> that's, <laughs> Actually Nancy, that's in the works for next year. Oh. Um, I know OPL. I'm going to work oh, with yes. the Labradoodle. The question was, is our, is, our oh, dog reading, is our dog reading new? Yeah. yeah. Um, we, I, I'm going to be very much involved with that, and um, I am really going to try to get students to sign up, and they will. They'll sign up to read to uh, Zia, um, but probably that's going to be more realistic a program for next year rather than this year. We've got five dogs that our children read to. That's wow. That'd be great. Someone here has five dogs that the kids read to. We might be calling her up. We're going to get some yeah. contact information. Because <laughs> we have 300, this year we have 325 students, I think. Right. At Saddlebrook. And next year it's slated to be, because we're going to move up to fifth grade. So it's slated to be 455, I think. Yeah. And then for one more year they're going to actually add sixth grade to the building because a new middle school is being built that will be six, seven, and eight and it won't be ready yet, and they don't want to send children to um, a middle school that's 5th, 6th, 7th. So um, we're going to, next year and the year after that especially, we are going to be loaded. So, And I think it's, is it time for a break? It is time, oh, I bet you guys are hungry. It is time for the break. There is our contact information, and like we said, the, um, uh, Whole PowerPoint will be available to you guys um, as soon as it gets uploaded. So thank you very much for having us.
I don't know what to do. <laughs> okay. Huh? <laughs> We hear you guys are going to take back the call. <laughs> or, or not. Okay. Thank you, Deb and Nancy. In the other room, help yourself. And I'm sorry you have to balance. Thank you, Deb and Nancy. That concludes our program. We have just a couple of um, things to talk about. Um, evaluations, um, they're on the PARA website, and please send them to Martha or uh, her email and her Gmail um, addresses are on the website. Also, we have seven free PARA are still key t-shirts. Ta-da. Um, five in medium, one in extra large and one in large. First come, first serve. Just email us and let us know. And remember again, evaluations. We need the evaluations. The general meeting follows at 1 o'clock. You're welcome to eat during it. You're welcome to stay for it. But thank you all for coming and attending this with us.